How's it going everyone? Data here and welcome back to the Philadelphia Flyers franchise mode episode number five headed into the 2023 off season. Now in the last one we had a bit of a surprising playoff run as we made it through the ghosts of Flyers past in round number one the Detroit Red Wings which included Claude Giroux and Shane Gosses Bear. We took them down in six games but went on to lose in six ourselves to the Carolina Hurricanes who went on to lose to the Lightning who went on to lose to the 2023 champs, the Minnesota Wild. In the postseason, we saw some really surprising and impressive performances, but uh, you know, difficulties in the top six. Scott Lawton, who was playing about 11 and a half minutes a night or so, 11 points in 12 games. Oscar Lindblom, six goals in 12 games. I think he had six and seven. That's, uh, yes, he had six and, or six and six even, but he had none in the second round, I don't think. It was all in the first round. Paul Stastny, one of our deadline pickups, eight points in 12 games from him, playing 15 minutes a night. Owen Tippett, Rasmus, my dear beloved son, Rasmus Ristolainen, seven points in 12 games. Morgan Frost, seven assists, great stuff. Connecting and Faraby only scoring two goals each. Phil Kessel, another deadline pick, pick up, scoring two goals. And Sean Couturier, who scored 35 goals in what, like 77 games in the regular season? One goal, five points in 12 games, negative seven as our first line centerman. So that really, really hurt us. Uh, Mark St uh, Michael Stone came in and he had some good stuff for us, four points in nine games. Uh, Provorov, three points, just wasn't great. Goaltending wasn't horrible. Carter Hart, 6-5-1 and one with a shutout. 914 save percentage, 2.74 goals against average. After a solid season as well, I think we're okay to say that Hart is our guy moving forward. But coming off of a season that saw us win 47 games and win the Metropolitan Division, we know that heading into next season, the bar of expectations for GM Data and his team of assistant general managers has been set quite high. Headed into this offseason, we do have a ton of salary cap space and not too many names we need to resign since we're able to dump Kevin Hayes, Cam Atkinson, and JVR in some better trades than others, but regardless, they are now gone moving forward. So the biggest questions of last episode were, what do we think about bringing back Phil Kessel and or Paul Stastny? And in general, what is our offseason plan? So as always, extremely appreciative of all the comments that were left by the assistant general managers because they make my job a lot easier. So I appreciate that. Even though I can't get to all of them in video, I do appreciate getting to interact with you down in the comments section. Starting off with Alfred, who says, were those GM data's wild? The Minnesota Wild winning. A little call back to the NHL 21 series. I think we should go all in on a big name in free agency. If there is one available, because Sean Couturier's playoff performance was concerning and he may be a better second line center at this point. Besides, having a top tier center in front may alleviate some pressure from him and or a top line wing could do the same. We have a lot of those top six elite type potential, some fringe guys who could develop into some solid players on our roster, so keep all that in mind moving forward. Oscar Lindblom won the captaincy in my opinion, another thing that's been debated in the comments section. Paul Stastny performed well enough in the playoffs to earn a one-year deal, and an entire season of Phil Kessel could work if we strike out in free agency. Thank you, Alfred. Penn's Gaming adds that it was a tough way to lose, both in real life and in the game, but overall, it was a good run for a young team. Some good performances for some, but huge disappointment from Couturier, and I think that puts a dent in his case for the captaincy. Let's take the positives and move forward, keep the team for the most part together, and add some depth pieces to strengthen the team. Now, I 100% agree with these thoughts, thank you Pens Gaming, but what's really interesting is that even if we do all of that, we should still have well over 10 million in cap space, so that will open some interesting possibilities come July 1st. Mason leaving his first comment ever on a video, so welcome to the Assistant General Manager's booth, Mason. I want to say if Claude Giroux hits free agency, you have to try to get him. And regarding the playoff performances, I don't think Sean Couture is captain material for this year. Great job on the videos. Go Flyers. Thank you, Mason. Scott says, after seeing what Oscar Lindblom did in round number one, I think this is the start of my official campaign to make him team captain a la Sam Reinhardt in our Columbus Blue Jackets series. He led the team in points for a large portion of the regular season. He earned an extension, which was pretty team friendly as well. And he carried the team in round number one. If nothing else, I think Oscar and or Risto deserve the born leader X-Factor with some of their timely goals. We'll keep note of that headed into next season if we make any X-Factor changes. For the offseason, I don't think we need to bring back both Stastny and Phil. Maybe one, if that. Maybe use that money to make a run at bringing Claude Giroux back. 
We need veteran presence down the stretch, and Phil wasn't particularly impressive in the playoffs. I agree. Thank you, Scott. Jared leaves a kind comment here. Us Flyers fans are begging for GM data in real life. We have the worst GM in the sport currently, so this series at least gives me some Flyers enjoyment, because I definitely will not be enjoying them in real life. Jared, I'm glad that I can be providing that to you and all the other Flyer fans out there at the very least. Super Loser says, solid run compared to how the real Flyers will likely finish. This season is a resounding success. The top line was a letdown in the playoffs. Lindblom didn't have a single goal in the second round, and Couturier and Konechny were just flat out disappointing. Action may not be necessary now, but is definitely something to keep in mind. As for Stastny and Kessel, I'd give both one year deals with no prospects ready to make the jump to the NHL. That's always tough because growth can be a bit of, uh, you know, it's a bit random at times in, over the offseason. There's no reason not to. If either underperforms, they can always be traded away. Good luck this offseason. Thank you, my friend. And closing it out with the last YouTube comment, Colton says, Made my way through the Kraken franchise, and I'm officially current and ready to sign my assistant GM contract to give my two cents on the direction I think the Flyers should be moving in. Colton, welcome into the assistant general manager's booth. Loved your moves last episode. Allowed for a push this year, but also creates room for growing players. Much of the top-end talent on this team has peaked, and I think it will be hard hard to push further without focusing on younger players this next season. Faraby, Tippett, and Frost are all players that could easily become part of the top core of this team. Giving them the appropriate minutes this next season and focusing on their development should be key. I think the team needs a guy, though. I question whether Matthew Savoie can be that. We need someone that will age well with the team and is the unquestioned franchise player that we plan to build around. So it depends. Will that player come through acquisition or through drafting? Moving out some of the 29 plus year olds on the team to help make room for and bring in the guy seems like a good move to me. I'd expect to take a step back next season, but really start developing the young core this team already has. Thank you, Colton. Over to the Discord server, the Gritisher says, going back to watch this series after the atrocious happenings with the Flyers, which I won't get into, hashtag Fire Fletcher, hashtag Boycott Flyers, the episode was very bittersweet. Thank you, Data, for being a much better GM than Fletcher. I wish I lived in that universe instead of this darkest timeline. Again, my heart goes out to Flyer fans. <laughs> With that out of the way, as far as the offseason moves go, I wouldn't re-sign any of the UFAs over 30. It's time for a youth movement in Philly. Guys like Allison, Ratcliffe, McEwen, etc. are fine as fourth liners, and you can probably find better options for Stastny and Kessel in free agency. Giroux is also potentially available. And if you don't go after him, some Philly fans might get a hashtag fire data trending. Just saying. With Couturier, do not ship him out. Worst case scenario, just wait until Savoie or another draft pick grows and is ready to take over first line minutes and have him play second line. Just my two cents. Keep up the great work. And as always, go Flyers. Addy says that he would sign Stastny if the price is reasonable and let go of Phil Kessel, so it might depend on the roster spots that are open. In free agency, look for that true first-line center slash first-line player. Since Couturier is more of a defensive guy, he may just fit well on that second line, and we have the money to bring in a true first-liner. Thank you, Addy. Closing out the Discord comments with one last one coming from Pat. Absolutely a season to be proud of. I nominate Lindblom to receive two silver badges, the leadership slash team boost on a goal one for his amazing first round, the natural born leader, and dealer's choice for the second. Agreement with the Gritisher there, keep Couturier as long as is reasonable, and try to bring back Giroux short term if possible to claim some franchise records before he walks off into the sunset. Don't re-sign Kessel or Stastny. Keep that cap space open in case a truly great option or two come up. Both will likely be low 80s next season and will be cheaper in August. As much fun as they are, they are replacement level. If Savoie is even a 78 overall next season, start him in the NHL, maximize that growth, and take advantage of that entry-level contract. Thank you, Pat. Raising good points, you know, deep down in my heart, I would love to keep Kessel and Stastny, but at 35 and 37 years of age, respectively, those overalls are going to continue to drop, and they might find themselves just kind of on third line roles and if they're on the third line then where does Bobby Brink where does Scott Lawton where do those guys go because right now if we're going to go into next season with just our signed players looking at our forwards first line Couture Farabee Konechny second line Lindblom Tippett and that's you know I guess that's Morgan Frost 
Third line would be Lawton, Brink, and then I guess maybe Ratcliffe could come up there. And then you have your fourth line as those replacement guys, McEwen and whoever else gets signed. That's right. Now, you bring in a big top six name. Let's say it's a number one centerman. You have Faraby Konechny, number one centerman. Second line, Couturier with Lindblom and Tippett, thus kind of forcing Morgan Frost out of the top six and onto the third line, which is already a bit questionable. I don't know if I want to do that. So we have the money to bring in a big name, but it's going to be difficult. I'm not sure where that big name would fit, especially if we are moving into a youth movement in Philadelphia. That's the difficult part. So we'll have to keep all that in mind headed into this draft. Honestly, I think that Stastny and Kessel are going to be players that we want to keep tabs on in free agency, but I'm not sure if I want to commit to re-signing them just yet. Uh, it's it's the, the roster spots, really, because Scott Lawton was amazing the postseason. Already, he'd probably be pushing for top six time, but we're going to have him on the third line. If our center depth goes Couturier, Frost, Lawton, where does Stastny really slot in? And if Lawton goes to the wing, then that means someone like Bobby Brinks being pushed to the fourth line. We can't do that. He has good potential to be a great playmaker. So now we're going to be headed into the draft with all that being kept in mind. It doesn't really affect the draft, but I do have to say there is one extremely interesting comment that was left on the Discord server. As our friend Brian Michaelak comments, what happened to Maurice Sider on Detroit? That's true. In the playoffs, when we played Detroit in the first round, we didn't see him. He wasn't on their roster in the playoff video. I thought it was weird, but he wasn't injured, wasn't scratched. What happened? So I went into the player search to say, I'm just curious, did he get traded? Like, where's he at? So we search him up and we see that, oh, he's still on Detroit. He's actually an 87 overall. Where was he then? Well, here's what happened in EA land. In 2021-22, instead of winning the Calder Trophy, scoring 50 plus points, he actually had a 30 point season, was a negative 16, and was promptly sent down to the AHL in 2022-23. He scored 72 points in 82 games, but is he now disgruntled with the Detroit Red Wings and their management? That's something to keep in mind because also his trade value is not particularly high. And at the same time, here in Philly, when it comes to defense, we have Ivan Provorov, who went from medium elite potential to low top 4D, also an 87 overall, four or five years old, I think four years older. He had 47 points in 82 games this past season, has the X-Factors, is a great leader, is a fixture here on Philadelphia with a pretty reasonable contract. But with his potential dropping from medium elite to low top 4, and with Moritz Sider being disgruntled in Detroit, I wonder if a trade possibility may be there. Now, I know what you're thinking. Moritz Sider would never leave Detroit. He's the future Norris Trophy winner. It's not realistic at all to even think about a trade with Detroit. However, while we are always keeping everything 100% realistic as much as possible in our franchise mode series, we do also go by the reality of EA land and not just by the real world. In EA land, Moritz Sider had a 30-point rookie season, not a 50-point rookie season, did not win the Calder, and for some unknown reason was buried in the AHL. Were this the real world, public sentiment around Moritz Sider would not be as high. I'm sure that he would actually be quite upset with Detroit management, and I wouldn't be surprised if they were looking to find a trade, especially with his trade value having, you know, kind of being pretty low comparative to other players with that potential and overall at that age. It reminds me of the Alex Tuck trade from Vegas in our Seattle Kraken franchise mode. We got him for pretty cheap and it wasn't the most realistic thing in terms of real world trades, but the guy was being buried on the fourth line and had like eight, nine minutes of ice time a night and he was very upset. So according to EA Land, that was a great trade that made sense. So when we're making these, even if the trade doesn't happen, if we try and make the trade, I don't want you to think, oh, Detroit would never trade him, that makes no sense, he won the Calder, he's gonna win the Norris, he's their future. Well, over here, we're two years into franchise mode, he's only played one season, and was sent down to the AHL right afterwards. So you know what? I, as the GM of Philadelphia, have an obligation to at least look into this. I believe that's what we're going to do. Now, in this draft, we don't pick until 27th. There really aren't any big names we want to trade up for in the first round. It's medium elites in the first five, six, but after that, it really drops off. Not really drops off in terms of they're terrible, but you know, you know, your typical draft class, a lot of top six forwards, top four D, stuff like that. 
we could go ahead and make our late first round pick and get a medium top six forward, maybe even a low elite forward. There's this guy here, Forstrom, who's three bars low elite. So that's definitely interesting. But if it means, you know, if trading that pick means getting more eight cider, I'd be curious to look into it. So at the very least, we will do so. Let's get the first pick out of the way. The New, New Jersey Devils will go ahead and select Connor Bedard with the first overall pick. Medium franchise, 79 overall. He will have a great career, and Devils fans are very happy to have him on board. I believe they won the draft lottery as well. So very lucky to have Connor Bedard in their franchise as their future number one. Let's go check out Detroit over here. I doubt he's actually on the trade block, but I will be curious to see how far off a one-for-one -one type of thing would be. Maurice Sider... On the outs in Detroit, furious with management after he did well in Europe, he had a good rookie season, and then why would you send me down when we had a chance to go far? We were a playoff team, we were in the first round, we could, I could have helped you beat Philadelphia, and you didn't call me up. So I see where his frustration would be. Now, the, the Detroit Red Wings do want Provorov, but they would be over the salary cap. So when I was thinking about this trade, I did keep in mind that the uh, Detroit Red Wings do have... And actually, by the way, here's Marco Casper. What are the odds? He got drafted here 8th overall in the real world, 44th overall here in EA land. But the uh, Red Wings do have Claude Giroux on the team on an expiring contract. The problem is, even as an 87 overall, it might be a bit expensive to pick him up. But imagine we get Moritz Sider and the rights to Claude Giroux for Ivan Provorov and more. Just how much would that and more cost is the question. We have a bunch of third and fourth round picks, including back-to-back -back fourth round picks. So I don't want to give too much too early, but maybe we could try two fourth round picks with Ivan Provorov to Detroit for Moritz Sider and the rights to Claude Giroux. Ivan Provorov, he'll have two more years after this one. I, all those positives I just said about him, he's an 87 overall two-way D with five-star puck skills, four-star shooting, six foot one. He is, uh, he's, you know, he's a top pairing D-man. What kind of message do we get back when we send this trade? Uh, we see it's, you have to make it worth our while. The value we have on the table is too far off. Okay, now what happens if we throw in another fourth round pick? Does it start to change the tides at all? Isn't sufficient at all. Okay. What kind of prospects could we toss in here? I wouldn't want to toss in McLennan, Forrester. Wouldn't want to add these guys in. But if we just sort by trade value, what kind of players would we see as expendable? Maybe Tuamala. Tuamala, 68 overall, 20 years of age. Uh, second round pick in 2021. So that's a decent prospect right there. So Tomala, two fourths, and Provorov. What are we thinking here? Too far off. I, but I feel like it's getting there. Sometimes there's like hidden trade value where the player is worth more than it actually says because he's not on the block. But I think we're close. Pick ninety one might be enough to push this over. Provorov, a third, two fourths, and a prospect for Moritz Sider, who's on the outs. And of course, even though there's twenty seconds left, it kicks me off for some reason. Mackey going to the Islanders, a medium elite uh, playmaking winger. Okay, so let's try this. Instead of the back-to-back -back fourth round picks, I'm going to try 91, 98, 121 with Twamala and Ivan Provorov to Detroit for the rights of Claude Giroux, bring the captain back, and Moritz Sider. I don't see this as cheesing it at all. He has been on the outs. The storyline makes sense, in my opinion. And, you know, they assign the trade value to him. If they don't see him as as valuable anymore because there's a holdout, well, that's why his value's taken a dip a little bit. And they're recouping a first pair D-man, a prospect, and picks. Still isn't sufficient at all, but I feel like it's almost there. Maybe we could just toss in a third next season. We have a few picks. We have two first and a second next year. Let's toss in a third here. I think this could be enough. Two thirds, a fourth, a prospect, and Ivan Provorov. I'm not giving a first in five years. I'm not giving a 48 overall prospect with juiced trade value. I think this is a good deal for both sides, considering that Giroud is going to free agency and Moritz Sider does not want to be with Detroit, presumably, because the management has buried him and he's not happy with how he's been treated. What do you say to this, Detroit? Uh, just a bit low for us. Let's take out pick 98, make it pick 97. How about moving up one pick? What do you say here? One pick, just a touch. Come on. Make it 97. I'm going to have to go down to 91, giving up another third. Just a touch. Yeah, we're going to have to give up another third, unfortunately. So I'll go 83 and 91 with a third next year. Can you give me back a seventh next season? A sixth next season? Come on. 20 seconds left. Let's make it happen here. Let's go, Detroit. Make it happen. I'm going to have to redo this whole thing, won't I? 
Come on, 24 seconds. Of course. Why put a clock if there's no reason to respect the time? As the Coyotes get a medium elite center sniper, 79 overall. Let's try it again now. Ivan Provorov, Tromala, picks 83, 91, and a third next season for the rights to Claude Giroux, the rejuvenated and revitalized Maurice Sider now that he's going to get a spot in the NHL, and a seventh round pick next year. Stevie Y. Stevie Y. Trade accepted. Can't give those picks up. What a blockbuster made here on the draft floor. GM Data and Stevie Y wouldn't stop talking. Ivan Provorov, the new number one D-man in Detroit and Maurice Sider the future here in Philadelphia he will be given every opportunity to succeed I don't know what went wrong in Detroit but he wanted to leave and oh by the way welcome back to the captain Claude Giroux we still have to get him signed on but we have his rights we won't need to compete against other teams and hopefully we can get him at a discount which unfortunately was probably gonna be why we probably couldn't get him because free agent signings are always an overpayment but that is a huge blockbuster here going down on draft night Ivan Provorov being swapped for Cider and the rights to Claude Giroux with other pieces going around. And we still get to keep our first round pick as well, which is very nice. So I guess let's just go all the way ahead and pick all the way, all the, go all the way to pick number 27 because I don't think anybody we really wanted was going to go before then. A few medium elites going, Jaeger, Mebius, Benson. Uh, so a few seven, mid-70 overall guys, a lot of 60s. Low top 4D, medium top 6 forward, stuff like that. So here we are at pick number 27 now. And it pretty much comes down to, do we want a defenseman who is two years away? Or do we want a power forward, potentially six foot three winger, who is three years away? Or do we go for the guaranteed medium top 6 forward, also three years away? These, are all, these guys are all uh, three years away as well, right? Yeah, Lind, uh, 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 Strum, Oren Strum is two years away, and similar to Marion Gabrick. That's interesting, hard wrist shot, elite speed, I like this guy. But another centerman, I think we're good in the center position, that's why, I, that's why these guys are all centermen. I think wing or D, so I'm between Forstrom and Henritius. Henritius, the 18-year-old left defen defensive defenseman. Similar to Mark Edward Vlasky, he's probably like uh, two years away, he's probably like high 60s, low 70s overall. Forstrom, probably in like a 60s, probably like the 63, 64 range. Yeah, it just depends, what are we thinking of? Do we want the defenseman or the forward? Just trying to take our depth into consideration. I think defense is what we need the most. But let's say it's a guaranteed low top, uh, medium top four versus a guaranteed low elite. Would I rather take the low elite? He'll probably have X factors as well. That's the tough part. Big fits the Philly style. Big six foot three guy, two hundred eleven pounds already at the age of eighteen, but a big defensive defenseman as well. Well, he's six foot one. He's probably the higher overall, but will he develop? Joaquim Henritius. I think defense is more of a need. Yeah. I think defense is more of the need here. It hurts because Forstrom, I basically low elite with X factors, and that's fine. But I think we're going to go. I've, this is one of the longest times I've ever taken to think about a draft pick. Let's do it <sighs> up to the podium with the 27th overall selection in the 2023 NHL entry draft. The Philadelphia Flyers are proud to select from Turku, Joaquim Henritius. Welcome to Philly, Bello. Let's see what you got. 70 overall, medium top 4D. I like it. Had to rush the podium there because the, the time was counting down. 70 overall, 82 shot blocking, 80 stick checking. Not horrible skating for a defensive defenseman. Usually it's pretty bad. His physical is okay. He has bouncer and truculence as superstar abilities, so that's good. All right, I'll take that. I'll take that. Boston, are they going to take that low elite guy? No, they take the medium top 4D. Uh, and I want to trade their pick. I'd be tempted to trade into the first round. But what do we have left, really, right? We just have a bunch of uh, third-round picks here, third and fourth. I don't think, even if we traded all of our picks, we'd be able to get them. Uh, the low elite guy, that is. Uh, draft picks, I have a third, yeah. Even if I did th a third and all these fourths, it wouldn't be enough to get this first here. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Trade accepted. In an exceptionally weak draft year, I will take that. Anaheim, you want quantity over quality? That's okay with me. I'm shocked at that one. Uh, just a package of thirds and fourths. They wanted to trade the pick. They wanted our picks. They didn't like the guy that was going to go here at 29. That's okay with me. 
So we're gonna go ahead and select this guy, Lars Forstrom from Sweden. What do you got here, big boy? He is low elite, 63 overall, power forward. Does he have the X factors? Yes, he does. His zone ability, superstar ability, good. Okay, okay. Now, I made that trade, although it was a bit premature and a bit uh, jumping the gun, I did make that trade because I'm very confident in this trade, this draft class being pretty weak. I went through it quite in depth. Okay, we're picking at 91, who's at 91? We're picking at 107, who's at 107? I did all that, and there really wasn't anyone who really... I didn't put anyone on my watch list. I was not impressed with this draft class, so you gotta trust me on this one. That is not usually something that I do whatsoever, but in this draft class, I'm okay with it. Okay, so let me show you who I would like to go for later on in this draft, but like definitely not anytime soon. I, I was thinking of maybe this low elite guy, Tommy Centavuri, Centavuri, four years away though, low elite, not necessary to trade all the way in the 60s for him, but now we, that we're going to be picking a little bit later, Oberg, low top six over there. Two bar low elite, just a lot of AHL guys, because in year two, we still have a lot of real players, like this guy, Cataford, for example, this guy is real, he's going to be AHL high top six, it's the European guys that I'm thinking about, so Janssen, Tulipop, these guys who are possibly low elites, that's who I'm thinking about picking up, but I'm okay with probably going all the way to 155, no one's really speaking to me, Aside, hold on, Rissanen here, a winger, two way forward, three bars low elite, I can see this guy, come on, let's go, scroll, scroll, 18 years of age, uh, five years away though, it's probably like uh, 50, 48 overall, something like that. Really, look, yeah, just look at this with me, you know, like no one really standing out at all. Yeah, we need to replenish, not replenish, but we need to get a good stockpile of, uh, of uh, prospects going. But in a year like this, mm -mm, I don't think so. So let's try and trade up for that uh, low elite guy. Where is he going to go again? It was in uh, around 112. So let's try and move into you know 110 or something like that, and we'll see what we can do. So I'm going to see if trading 155 and 187, along with what do we have an abundance of, one of those sevenths from next year, or even a couple of years. Uh, I'll give you a sixth and a couple of years. So two sixths and a, and a fifth to move up for a fourth. I think they should be happy with this. I'll even try to squeeze a seventh out of them next season, try to balance it out a bit more. So can we go two fifths, two, uh, a fifth and two sixths for a fourth and a seventh? Trade accepted, thank you very much Arizona. So we'll go ahead and jump to that selection. That'll be the only other pick we make in this draft, ladies and gentlemen. In a weaker draft like this, I'm okay with quality over quantity, as opposed to the Ducks, they wanted quantity. So we'll go ahead and take this guy, I really hope he's low elite, I really, really hope he does, he is. A left winger, 5'11", even if he's not great, he has the potential, and yes, so he's 50 overall, low elite, definitely a project, but we need these guys who have trade value, who, you know, they grow, maybe there's no room for them on the team, and then they can get traded for assets, or they become a surprise and they do make our team, those are the great storylines in franchise mode. Also, I'm curious, those back-to-back -back fourth round picks we traded, yeah, medium bottom six and low bottom six, so I'm okay with trading that. Medium bottom sixes, low top nines, a lot of AHL even top six. These are the guys that we traded, that we missed out on taking. Low top nines, medium top nines. Yeah, there's a few medium elites in there sprinkled in, absolutely. But I don't know if I was willing to take a risk on one of those two bar guys. Medium seventh D, medium sixth D, medium bottom six, high AHL top six. Yeah, this is a year that we could do this. This is one of the, pretty much the only year, year one or two is pretty much the only years that you can do that type of strategy and I'm okay with it. So there's the draft for us, unless we really want somebody else, but I don't think so. Just sorting by potential, there was no one that stuck out to me. It's crazy. Do all this scouting just to draft three players, but that's what it took you. So we got one guy, two bar medium elite, I, that's not convincing enough. Two bar low elite, not convincing enough, especially in how scary this draft class is. Two bar, no, nothing more than two bars. So with the scouts still developing, with the prospects having to get better, we'll go ahead and sim to the end of this draft, having just drafted those three players. At 27, we get the medium top 4D. At 29, we get the low elite left winger. And at 109, we get another low elite left winger. Okay, so there are our three selections. Probably the, the fewest amounts of selections I've ever made in a draft, honestly. But hey, the big news here in Philadelphia is that Moritz Sider and Claude Giroux are in the organization. We just got to make sure that they're signed up and happy. I'll take care of all the scouting and coaching contracts, and we'll be back in the contract screen in just a second. All right, re-sign phase. Here we go. We have 32.75 million to play with, and we probably won't be using all of it. I'm sure the owner of the team is going to be happy that we're not using all of it. 
Claude Giroux now. What kind of deal would he want? I hope it's really reasonable. He wants 6.775 for 1 million. Now, another reason why I brought Claude Giroux back is because I'm confident that he will sign on. He wants to be on a team that's going to be having an opportunity to win a Stanley Cup. In the real world, that's unfortunately not the Flyers right now. Over here, we just won the Metropolitan Division, lost in the second round. Things are looking up. If we go for two years, he wants more. Three years, he wants more. Keeps getting more and more until he wants four million. So honestly, I think I'm going to go one year and hope that his request next year is less. Unless I go for 6.9 because 85% of 6.95, it would be two years at 5.925. So do I want two years at 5.925? Or do I want one year at 5.8? 5.8 for one or 5.925 for two? With all that money to play with, I think I'm going to go for two. The only reason I don't go for three is because when we get the age of 38, that's when his overall and potential will really be dropping. But for two years, he could still be 86, 87 overall for the ages of 35, 36, maybe even 37. With a lot of money to spare, I'm okay with taking that risk. Two years, 5.925. Let's see what Claude Giroux has to say. Now, Kessel, Stastny, we have the money, but I don't think we have the roster spots. That is the really the only problem. Let me take care of the other players first. So, guys, the RFAs here. First and foremost, Cam York, our, probably our top defensive prospect, you could call him. We could give him a four-year deal to keep him as an RFA. I think that makes the most sense for us. To go two more years to pay a little bit more, I don't think that makes a lot of sense for us. So, we're going to go four years to re retain the RFA status. 4.375 at 85% is 3.71. So 3.725 for four years. I think that's a very fair contract, especially for a guy who just had his rookie season, right? Hasn't really done too much for us yet. Four years, 3.725. I'm on board for that. Cam York, let me know. Ronnie Attard, who was great as a, a third pairing with Cam York. Another guy that I want to keep within RFA status. 1.375, 1.175, yeah. 1.175 for two years. I'm okay with that for Ronnie. Uh, Zach McEwen, he didn't really get much time in the NHL this past year, but I'd like to use him in a depth role if possible. So a solid one year, 975K sounds okay to me. Uh, then we get some other guys. Strom, I'm going to sign up. I'm going to sign most of these guys. I'm not going to make you sit through all of these depth signings and minor league signings. Uh, I will let go of Brandon Sutter. He was a depth guy for us. We thought he'd be playing more fourth line minutes, but Ratcliffe and, um, and Lawton taking up a lot of the fourth line minutes. He just came on in as a 13th forward. He only played in 15 games, went scoreless, had six shots in 15 games. Even plus minus, hey, uh, face-offs, 45.83. Okay, but we're going to let him walk because there's not really any room for him and we have other players who can take 13th forward roles. So thank you for your time here. Brown, we can let him walk as well. Uh, a lot of these guys are just, you can find replacement level guys in free agency. I'd rather find guys with more potential and we'll sign on these two UFA prospects. Let's get all this figured out first and we'll take care of the other guys later on. Matthew Savoie, I won't give him his ELC just yet, but very likely uh, a candidate to be signed. And goaltenders, all expiring. Uh, Michael Novert is going to walk. He was our third goalie. Thank you for your time. Sandstrom and Ustamenko, I will sign them both and we'll see what offseason growth says for them. I don't know if both can stay in the organization or if one can even move up as the new third goalie, but I'll just give a... You go eight years? No, okay, oh, it's a two-way deal. Uh, would he be interested in two years max contract, but th two years two-way? Three might be a bit too cheese. So, Ustamenko, what do you say as well? He wants the same thing. We'll go, yeah, we'll get the exact same deal. And two years for him actually keeps him as an RFA, so that's more tempting. So, I'll send out the rest of the contracts and we'll advance a day. Oh, and Stone. We can't forget Michael Stone, who had a great postseason. 1.4. The guy's a 7th D-man. He wants 1.4. We could probably get him for like 1.2. No, for a 78 overall, there are cheaper options you can get for league minimum in August. So, Michael Stone, I'm sorry. I would have wanted to keep you. Even with a lot of money, I, that's not a smart business decision for us, so I'm going to have to let you walk. All right, advancing a day now. Claude Giroux, although I'm interested in principle to an extension, I'm going to reject this offer at this dollar value. If you're going to change the duration, I expect you to adjust the financials accordingly. Okay, we'll get back to that later. Ronnie, easy decision. Noah Cates, Zach McEwen, Cam York. He doesn't like how long we the duration. I thought the duration we hadn't touched. 
Matthew Strom, Felix Sandstrom, Wyatt Wiley, Hogberg, Ustamenko, Cates, Zanetti, Sampson, Case, Kasha, whatever. Okay, they're all in. That's good. Claude, buddy, I gave you an extra year even. You should be happy about that. 5.9, whatever. Okay, let's go in even two years. Maybe even more than 6 million. Let's go two years at 6.1. Two years at 6.1, Claude. Let's go. $12.2 million for you. That's a nice little pocket change, right? Cam York didn't like that contract either. Yeah, instead of six years, I gave him four years. Uh, shouldn't be that big of a problem. I'm really not going to break my head over this. I can just qualify him and get this done on July 1st. But he didn't like 3.75. I'll give him 3.8 for four years. So that's pretty much it. For, uh, I'll even go 8.5. 3.85, four years, final offer. If you don't like it, you're going to walk. And Well, I'm going to qualify you and sign you later. All the scouts signing on. Great. Drew still doesn't like it. And now it is York. All right. So Cam York, bye-bye. Qualify you. See you on July 1st when your robot brain gets wiped when the clock strikes 12. Claude Giroux does not like 6.2, 6.1 for two years. We might have to go for, for one year then. I don't want to pay him too much. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to have to do. Because if I start paying him 6.5, 6.7 for two years, and he really drops off after year number one, that's going to hurt a little bit more when money begins to start getting a little tighter. So I'll try for the one year. At 6.775, we can go for 5.8 for one year. So if he doesn't like that, then I'll start increasing it. But I'm going to try the 85% first. 5.8 for one year. Let's see what he says. Scouts are happy. Uh, more scouts are happy, and Giroux still doesn't like it, uh, so now we're going to have to go into the next uh, little step here, which would be one year. Let's try 6.25. Let's keep him happy. One year, 6.25. Get back to me tonight. Claude! Ah, oh, come on. 6.5 then, Claude. Away. Grui. 6.5. Final day. Yeah, it's the final day. Let's do it. Easy decision. Claude Giroux, welcome back to Philadelphia. The fans are going crazy in the streets. Does he get the C back right away? We'll have to think about that. It's important for me to get what I want, blah, 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 blah. One year signed on. We still have two, over 26 and a half million to play with. That's a big signing for us. More Sider extension is going to be coming soon as well. Got to think about that. So UFAs, we still have room for Kessel and Stastny monetarily, but I'm not sure what's going to happen. Do we bring back these guys as well? I think we do, but I'll just qualify them because now I don't want to risk them saying no here on the last day of free agency. And goalies, everyone's taken care of, I believe. Yes. I mean, it makes sense, you know? Okay, I'm coming back to Philadelphia. Here's a one-year prove-it-to-me deal that I'm going to stay here and finish my career with you. Makes sense. Let's see what happens in this one year. But for these UFAs, like, I'm, again, we need... How many forwards do you need on a team? 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Now, minus Stastny and Kessel, we need two more. 1, 2. There you go. Ratcliffe and Allison. That's with McEwen making the lineup as a full-timer. And not even taking into account the potential growth of Forrester or Matthew Savoie. So I just don't think it works for us. Although I'd love Phil Kessel to be here... Uh, and, and Paul Stastny. Stastny is the one that doesn't make sense the most, I think, just because of his o being older and his being a centerman. So I'm going to go ahead and release Stastny right away, but maybe Kessel can come in and McEwen is a depth guy. Maybe it could work for Phil the Thrill to be here on a one-year deal. I'm going to try one year. Worst case, it's a one-year deal and, you know, halfway through the year, it's expiring and a team wants him for a playoff run. Two year, uh, One year at 2.175. Phil the Thrill Castle. He takes it or he doesn't. That's it. I'm not trying any more than that. He takes it or he doesn't. I'm not going to go crazy to get Phil on the team. Okay, so with the team pretty much set now, and I'm sure Flyer Management being very happy that we have a serviceable team to put on the ice and still have so much money saved. Uh, not okay. Uh, Phil was not content with the amount of minutes he played last season. I'm not going to give him 2.75, 3 million or whatever. Let him go to free agency. That's it. It was not meant to be. Maybe he comes back as a deadline pickup. Who knows? But now going into free agency, I wonder who the big fish are out here, especially as the UFAs. UFAs sorting by overall. Wow, Chris Letang in free agency. Uh, I would almost go to get Chris Letang, but there's no way he leaves Pittsburgh and signs in Philadelphia. So I'm not even going to try that. If you're upset about the realism of Maurice Sider at all, there's realism coming into play right there. Not going for Chris Letang. Vladimir Tarasenko with three teams interested in him. Not going to happen. Bunting, no. But, no, Hala, no. I'd be curious to think about a defenseman if Ronnie is not good enough and he has to be a 7th D-man. 
But then I'd only need someone who's like an 81, 82. I wouldn't need a big fish. Because if Cider and Ellis is pair number one and Samheim Risto is pair number two, already Camior might push one of those people down onto the third pair. I don't need another really good guy being upset about ice time. Let's see, sorting by potential, any prospects who have dropped out here. Chimlevsky wouldn't be bad. Mason Shaw is always a classic to have in franchise mode. Blickfeld, uh, Lias Anderson, or Leas Anderson. Oh, I wouldn't mind some of these guys for the AHL, actually. How about this guy, even? McLaughlin. McLaughlin. Mark McLaughlin. McLaughlin. He's a sniper. 78 overall, 23 years of age. Yeah, I'll sign you. Let's go uh, three years max deal. Max two-way deal. Bang. Let's see what you got to say, Mark. Uh, and then another, any other people that are really interesting to me? Blickfeld, he's probably, a, he's almost fringe NHL though. He'd be pushing for NHL minutes. Joachim Blickfeld, how does this guy simulate? 79 overall, last season 49 points in 82 games in the AHL. Bah! I'm also tempted by Chimlevsky and Mason Shaw. Mason Shaw always seems to simulate quite well. Uh, he, he's a good playmaker, but I've had him in a, it's, we had him in Minnesota, we had him in Seattle, so I'll try to change things up. And Chimlevsky, 5 goals, 18 assists, 23 points in 82 games in the AHL. Sounds like Blickfeld's the guy here. So let's go for it. Maybe he be even becomes an AHL fringe guy. I'll give him a max one-year two-way deal. There you go. Uh, UFA defenseman by potential. Anyone interesting here? Uh, Carrier, Alexandre Carrier, who was... Uh, he received uh, Calder votes in the real world. Four and a half star shooting, uh, 91 deking, 87 offensive awareness. I'd be tempted to get this guy in here. But again, he'd be playing third pair. He wants four by 4.5. I don't know if that makes too much sense for us. Maybe a guy like Valamaki? That's interesting. For He's listed as a top six guy. Yuso Valamaki. I think he's better in the real world than he is in EA land. 86 shot blocking, 85 defensive awareness. He was a negative three last season, negative two the year before. Doesn't really contribute much offensively, which is okay. But I don't want to replace Ronnie Attar just yet. I'd have to consider what's going on in uh, in terms of growth. That's the hard thing. You don't know how much these guys are going to grow. It's not like MLB The Show that tells you how much they're going to grow. A Blankenberg, offensive defenseman. 20, Nick Blankenberg, undrafted, five foot nine offensive. Really? Where'd this guy come from? What did he do last season? He was in uh, with Colorado last year. 11 points in 78 games. Interesting, but 5'9". He has 4-star physical. 87 body checking at 5'9". That's crazy, actually. Uh, yeah, Valimaki's tempting. But I think I'm going to wait on that. I'm going to wait on it. I'm going to wait until, like, a, whatever, a month into free agency or whatever and see who's still out there as a 78, 79 overall, something like that. So I suppose we can begin simulating. So last couple of housekeeping things I need to do before we can start simulating towards next season. Number one is I need to go into the higher staff screen and see if there's any new scouts to sign now that it's July 1st. And there absolutely are. Look at these A-rated scouts, very good. So I'm gonna make sure I get these guys signed on to our team. Then I'll be right back for the draft class randomization. Okay, so 16 new scouts on the way. We're definitely clearing house and filled out. If you want to know more about scouting and why I just fired up most of my scouts to sign new ones here on July 1st, be sure to check out my 100% guide to everything scouting on NHL 22, which you can find here on the channel. Now, another thing I like to do in my franchise modes in the summer is changing the draft class quality. Now, the last couple of years has, have been low, low. I reset it to medium, medium, just in case I forgot, but thankfully I didn't, and here we are the last offseason I forgot. So draft class quality and generated prospect quality are things that we randomize. So in a number randomizer from 1 to 100, usually the scale that we go by is 1 to 30 low, then up to 70 is medium, then up to 100 is high. But I think with the last two years being low, low, I'm going to change this a little bit. I'm going to say 1 to 20 will be low. 21 to 79 will be medium, and 80 to 100 will be high. So generating the random number now, 1 to 100, I get 50, smack dab in the middle. So draft class quality will remain at medium. And by remain, I mean I'm not changing it from what I already changed because it was actually low the last two seasons. Generated prospect quality, randomizing number again. This time I get 28, so we'll keep medium there. So next year, the 2024 draft will be medium, medium. After the 2022 and 23 drafts were low, low. So now that all that is taken care of, I'm going to simulate up to, let's say, July 25th or so. And I'm going to try even 20th. I don't want to go too deep where everyone gets signed up, but we'll che recheck free agency and who's available for a 7th D slash 13th forward around that time. 
Mark McLaughlin signs up. Very nice. So does Joaquin Blickfeld. Welcome to Philadelphia. Cooper Zex signs back. He was an RFA that we had qualified. Speaking of qualifications, forgot about Cam York. So now we can finally get him for a bit cheaper after he was holding out back in the end of June. Almost forgot about you, buddy. That's what greed can do to you. So Cam York, we wanted to give him four years. He wants 4.35. I forget, honestly, if that was more or less than what he was asking for. That would be, I think it was a bit less, actually, because now it's 3.7 for four years he'd be getting at 85%. So there you go, buddy. Lost out on some money because of your greed. A little life lesson for you. Uh, and we can also consider an extension to Moritz Sider, which would actually be a pretty good thing to do. I wouldn't mind giving him a big boy contract instead of just a three-year. We'd go like eight years. So we can go eight years, probably in the seven million dollar range, or three years in this, probably in the high fives. But with his overall and how defense costs a lot, and you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and go all in right now. Let's get to the age of 30 and sign him up for eight years. Probably makes sense because that would probably like a condition of his trade anyways. So we can go eight years at 6.95, just a little bit shy of seven million dollars. So not quite an eight by seven. I don't want to be greedy and, you know, it's just 50,000, but on paper it looks a bit, it looks different, 6.95 to 7, it just looks different, but, you know, every little bit counts down the road, especially over the next eight years. So, let's see what Moritz Sider thinks about a big eight-year extension to stay here in Philly after he was disrespected over in Detroit, and we can jump into free agency and see if any seventh D uh, possibilities hop out at us, slash anyone else who may still be in free agency here. We still have a lot of money to play with. Eric Howell is still out here. Some RFAs. Let's look at the RFAs just for kicks here. Alexi Lafreniere, Troy Terry, Cal Foote, Julien Gauthier, all still out here. Uh, going to the UFAs only. Howla Smith, Marchment. Cheap deal for Marchment. My goodness, one year at 1.4. In the real world, that would be a steal and a half. What did he do last year in EA land? Uh, 14 points. Yeah, he's not quite the same in EA land. Duncan Keith still around. He's still alive. So let's just look at uh, defenseman at this point. Lekkonen, just done dirty by his overall. Yeah, these are the types of contracts that I'm talking about. Uh, Jeremy Lozon, I could see that being a good one. Yeah, he's Stone. It looks like it didn't work out for you, eh? Let's go for Lozon. He's one overall higher than Stone, asking for even less, actually, on paper. So 26 years of age, defensive defenseman. You're sold. Bring him aboard. One year at uh, .950. Jeremy Lozon, bienvenue à l'équipe. J'espère, mon ami. So let's start simming to next season. Cam York, I've decided to accept your offer. Okay, get in the back of the line. Moritz, buddy, I'm waiting for you. Jeremy Lozo, extremely happy to accept your offer. Merci beaucoup. And okay, Brendan Menel, he signed on. And Moritz Sider signed up for eight years in Philadelphia. How about that? Out of nowhere. So that's why the assistant general manager is so important. Shout out to Mr. Brian Michaelak. And everyone else in the Discord server throwing in their thoughts on that deal. Zamula signs on as an RFA. Wow, wow, wow. Provorov, it hurts to, for him to be gone. He was an alternate captain. Future captain material as well. But him downgrading in potential. And Detroit wanting, the, wanting him and uh, downplaying the trade value of Cider with all the stuff that was going on with them. It all just came together here in this alternate reality. And we arrive now at the beginning of the preseason. I'm going to take a moment to edit the lines for how we think we might be looking, see what kind of growth we had over the offseason, and have an idea of what kind of team we'll have on the ice in 2023-24. So here is how we are looking headed into 2023-24. Claude Giroux drops down to an 86 overall, no big deal, but he does have great chemistry for the first line. His potential is down to media exact top nine, so a bit concerning, but as long as he's playing well, it should his overall should be maintained. With Farabee and Tippett on the first line, that first line gets a plus two. Swap with Konechny, it's still a plus two, but the second line goes from plus one to zero. So that's why I'm thinking the second line is Lindblom, Couturier, Konechny, and Oscar Lindblom has grown to an 85 overall. Very impressive, but is listed as a third line forward. So it wouldn't be the end of the world if we put him on the third line, as you know he has great defensive attributes, a very well-rounded player overall. If we wanted to give his ice time to a guy like Morgan Frost or Bobby Brink, that wouldn't be a bad idea. Bobby Brink is up to an 82 overall. He's going to grow even more. 94 deking, 4.5 star puck skills, 90 offensive awareness. 
this, that's very tempting. I'd want to put him on the second line, perhaps. Even Morgan Frost, who's up to an 84, and he is listed as a second line forward. So maybe he should be the guy who's there instead of Oscar Lindblom. Great attributes there as well. Scott Lawton, 82. Fourth line, I'm going to try Matthew Strom, I think, this season. A fourth round pick back in 2017. A big boy who's been in the AHL for a while at a 78 overall. Let's give him a shot. Listed as a fourth line forward. Ratcliffe at center and Wade Allison on his right. The 13th forward would be Zach McEwen at a 79 overall. Grinder as his player type. Now going to the defense. This is where the chemistry is a bit difficult and why I'd almost go for a new head coach, honestly. Now Maurice Sider is up to an 88 overall. He is our guy for the next eight years, and he does not fit the first D pair. That enough, I believe, is enough to say we need a new head coach sooner rather than later, eventually. Uh, Cam York also saw growth this offseason, and he is up to an 84 overall. Very, very happy to see that. But no one can really play with uh, Moritz Sider. He could get a negative one with Sandheim, but then that hurts the second pair that has a plus two. Sandheim and Ellis, uh, 83 and 86 overall, respectively. Ristolainen at an 82. I don't like him on the third pair. And Jeremy Lozon has grown to an 80, which pushes Ronnie down to seventh D-man, as he is been, he is stuck at a 79 and is now listed as a depth defenseman after being listed as a top six last year, scoring 12 points, being a plus one, playing in all 82 games. You know, solid defensive attributes, but Lozon may be the better option for us as he is an 80 overall and looks like this, you know? So that's a tough call right there, but I think I give it to Lozon right now. Goaltending, more growth from Carter Hart as he has now an 87 overall. Love to see that. He is on the last year of his deal, so he'll need an extension after this year. Still backed up by 81 overall Malcolm Subban, who wasn't amazing down the stretch, but was 9-8-1 in the regular season. One shutout, 907 save percentage, 2.73 goals against average, a serviceable backup. Third goalie will be Felix Sandstrom, I think. Unless it's a long-term injury, we really need somebody. But we already have two goalies in the AHL which is why I think I'd rather, you know, and both 75 overall, which is why I think I'd rather call up one of them. Ustamenko, medium fringe starter. Uh, Erson, medium backup, but 23, while Sandstrom is medium backup, but 25 years of age. So this lineup doesn't cut too many people out in the AHL. No one's really pushing for the NHL. Forrester is still a 77. McLaughlin at a 78. Blickfeld, 79. No one's really pushing too crazily. Defense, Enright, the prospect we got from the Coyotes, from a 76 up to a 78. He's looking good. He should develop well. We have a lot of defensemen down here, but not a lot of guys who I think will make the NHL. If I had to put money on it, probably over only Enright and maybe Wiley of all these, of the top 6 D would make the NHL. Um, that's why we have like four scratch D, but I don't think any of them are really going to be making it. That's why I, I took our, our 27th overall pick to take a defenseman because I think we need more NHL serviceable defensemen in our system. But I digress. We'll see. You know, these guys could still grow, just they don't have the greatest potentials to do so. So the defense looks like that. Forwards look like that in the NHL. If need be, we could call up some people in a pinch. So I think we're in a pretty good spot organizationally, and we still have a lot of cap to play with, which is going to make management very happy. I think we still have over 20 million. Yeah, 22.69 million still out there. And if we want to start thinking about uh, um, uh, extensions as well, Morgan Frost would probably be wanting in the four or five millions. Bobby Brink would be wanting 1.5 for one. We've got him four years as an RFA for in the two millions. So there's something to keep in mind. I don't want to cheese it too long term. And for Carter Hart's extension, he would want to get paid somewhere around. Well, we could get him. Oh, yeah, that four. I'm going to I'm going to sign this right now. Three years, seven plus four years, seven plus for four years. He'll take five point seven five. 85% of that is 4.88. So let's try four years at 4.9 for Carter Hart. Four years at 4.9. Let's be a bit more realistic. 87 overall, who's had a couple solid seasons. He's still going to be in line for his big contract after this. But let's give him $20 million for four years. And then he can get into his big contract that'll take him to the end of his career after that. I think that's a bit more realistic. A four by five, which will still give us over $22 million in extension dollars. I am comfortable with that number for Carter Hart very much. So I believe there is the off season, my friends. Wrapping things up now. Captains and jerseys next episode. Does Claude Giroux get the C back right away? Is that just automatic? If so, do we keep the A's on Couturier and Lindblom? Or do we look at some other? 
other potential alternate captains in our system. We'll take it away from Maurice Sider, I believe, at least for the moment. Although signing that eight-year extension and committing to Philly long-term is huge. Great to have him on board. We'll close out by looking at the trade blocks. And also keep in mind all the lineup decisions. Who do you want to see in the preseason? Who do you want to see getting a shot? And what would they need to do to stay on the team? For example, try Morgan Frost in the top six. If he scores four points in seven games, keep him up there. Stuff like that is what I'd like to hear from all of you. Now, looking at the trade blocks, Troy Terry as an RFA is on the block in Anaheim. Arizona, nobody. Boston, prospect. Buffalo, a few names here. Victor Olofsson, most notably, as he has two years left on his deal. Paul Stassen signed a two-year deal there. Nyquist, Hosang, Tierney. Calgary Flames, Susie Vlasic. Uh, Noel Gundler, some other prospects in Carolina. Chicago prospects. Colorado prospects. Columbus prospects. Dallas, nobody. Detroit, Letty, Murphy, and Estroza. Cool, like a few guys on the block there. I'm very curious to see how they'll do with Ivan Provorov. Edmonton, Brad Lambert, and other prospects. Florida prospects. LA Kings, Sean Corrali. Minnesota, Foss, Zingle, Byron, and Soderberg. La Canadian Montreal, Personne. Predators, Ryan Johansson, two years left at $8 million. Don't think we're going to be too interested in that deal, but definitely a good player in EA land. Trocek, Subban, Woods, Zadorov, and Schultz all on the block in New Jersey. Islanders, no one. Rangers, Lafreniere as an RFA on the block. Wow. Zuccarello and other names. Ottawa Senators, uh, Dominic Cahoon. Pittsburgh Penguins, Carter, Comfer, Stahl, Donskoy. Stahl back in Pittsburgh, that's cool. Sanford, Sturm, again, down the list they go. San Jose, Nick Cousins. Seattle, nobody. St. Louis, Patrice Bergeron. Braden Shen and Ryan O'Reilly, three big centermen. Uh, keep in mind that these blocks will probably change over time, especially by the time we get through the preseason. Cal Foots RFA rights, Dargachinsev and prospects, Jet Wu and prospects, Vegas, Martinez, Keith, Yandel, a few other pieces, Backstrom, Eller, Haig, and, and uh, Magnuson in uh, Washington, Drouin, Niederreiter, Mikhaev, Wheeler, Connolly, Lowry, Pozo, and more in Winnipeg. Definitely some interesting names on the blocks. Keep in mind, like I just said, that those will likely change over time as we go through the preseason and towards the beginning of the season. But I'm looking forward to hearing what all of you have to say about the upcoming preseason and regular season, as well as what do you think about the 2023 off season? Do you give it thumbs up, thumbs down? How do you rate the off season? Bringing back Claude Giroux, making the Provorov cider swap. It wouldn't have been possible if Detroit hadn't buried cider. So we're going to give him new life here in Philadelphia. He is is our cornerstone on the blue line for years and years to come. Love the extension. Do you want any other extensions to happen headed into this next season or should we wait a little while? That's for all you assistant general managers to let me know down here in the YouTube comments or over on the Discord server. The link for that is in the description as always. I'll go ahead and leave you there as there's much to think about headed into 2023-24. So be sure to leave a like after this big off season in Philadelphia. And if you haven't already subscribed, now would be a great time to do so. It's free. You'll be made aware of all of our uploads when we do friends franchise mode, career simulations, Uri Slavkovsky, Shane Wright, the most recent ones that we just did, MLB The Show 22 franchise mode coming very soon, breaking news and analysis for the real world of hockey, and much, much more. So I believe that a subscription would be mutually beneficial, but I thank you once again for taking the time to watch, and I'm looking forward to seeing you once again in the next one.